Good morning, guys. My name is Manny, and I have uh, the privilege and the honor of being the pastor here at Cross Point. I have an even greater privilege, and that greater privilege is the opportunity to share the greatest news of all, right? The, the gospel message of Jesus Christ and the fact that he died for our sins. And because of that great sacrifice, we are made new. We are made whole. We are made complete. I say it every Sunday, and I never get tired of saying it, but welcome to the church. Welcome to the church. And when I say church, it's more than a building. Yes, we give God praises for a building, especially in muggy Texas, right? You've got praises that there's air condition that works, right? But air conditioned buildings aren't changing the world. God is not counting on an air conditioned building to change the world. God is counting on a Christian to change the world by how they decide to live out their faith in action every Monday through Sunday when they wake up and when they get out of bed. So, so welcome to the church. We're so grateful that you decided to, to spend this day with us, to spend this Sunday with us. We have been in the middle of our sermon series entitled Refocus, where we have been diving into what happens in our lives when we lose focus on the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We've all been there. What happens when we slowly but surely move further and further and further away from where he is and from where he's called us to be? You see, and majority of the time, it's not even like an intentional thing that the Christian does. Most of the time, if we're honest, we have, we have a really good reason. We have a really good built-in excuse on why we just move further and further and further away. The reasoning always sounds right in our minds. We as Christians have a very keen sense of how to, of how to spin it to win it. We say things like, we've been busy. That is the number one used excuse in all of the world. We have been busy, and you're not wrong, right? You're not lying. I mean, you are busy. The reality is, now more than ever, we're all more busy. We're busy. But what are we busy with? We say things like, nah, you know, I'm, I'm good, man, I'm good, right? My relationship with Jesus is, is exactly where it needs to be. My relationship with Jesus is good to go. I still read my word at home. Yeah, I, I don't really come often to church, but my personal relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is, is still good. And that may be the case. It may be. But soon enough, before you know it, as our busy schedules get more busy, what happens, right? be sports, tournaments, cheerleading, practice schedules, all real things, all legitimate reasons, right? But the reality is that without even knowing, your eyes are now fixed on a ton of things. Your eyes are fixed on many things at once, many things at once. And it doesn't mean that you're leaving him, right? It doesn't mean that you're changing your religious beliefs on your social media, nothing like that. But if we are honest, he's not the only ones that we have our eyes fixed on. And as we journeyed through the sermon series, we talked about the importance of the best way to focus on Jesus is to make sure that we're not focused on everything else. It doesn't mean that we don't do them. It doesn't mean that they're not a part of our daily schedules, but it means that they cannot take the place or the focus that we have on our Messiah. Like that needs to be the first thing and the first person that we're focusing in on. Again, it doesn't mean that we're, you know, we're, we're shifting or we're changing. But we say these things because in reality, it helps us feel less bad about forsaking what the writer of Hebrews 10.25 talked about. And what did he talk about in Hebrews 10, 25? He was talking about the importance of assembling together. 
You see, there is something that happens in community. There is something that happens when the church comes together that cannot be replicated. Can't be replicated. I don't know if you remember COVID. Most of us have experienced that a little different than people in ministry. I remember the first two weeks I was like, bet, like I'll preach to a camera. No one's sitting here. This would be the easiest sermon ever. This is going to be great. Two weeks in, I was like, I cannot do that anymore. I, I, I will not do it if my wife needs to sit in here or my, my kid needs to be running around. I, I cannot. I'm not built for solitude. And in reality, none of us are. That's what the enemy wants us to believe. But the reality is where we win at life is in community not on that island alone, but that's what we do as Christians, right? We, we justify, we, we sell ourselves in order to not feel conviction, which is why in all reality, man, I, I truly appreciate my brother-in-law's raw honesty, his raw honesty. See, we've been praying for his soul for years, and we feel like there's certain times in that living room where he's right there. And I'm like, just, you're there. Just punch it in. Sometimes I want to get behind him and like push him over. I'm like, you're there. The line is there. Do it. You're right there. But I appreciate his honesty. I really do. Every Saturday when his nephew and his nieces and his nieces invite him to church. He keeps it all the way real with them. He doesn't fabricate his answer. He asks them, okay, I'm for it. Are you going to be on stage? Are you performing in any way? Because he'll come for that. And if they're not performing or if they're not being baptized, he follows that up with a joke, but really is his honesty. He's like, is it Easter or Christmas? He'll say that, right? And for us as churchgoers, we hear that and we're like, whoa. I mean, what's going on there? And he'll flat out tell them, it's not worth me having to wake up for a gathering at church. I'd rather sleep in. And when we as Christians, when we hear that, right, it's like, it's low-key appalling, it's like almost offensive, right? But that's why we pray for him. And that's why we are, are praying for his salvation. That's why we're praying that the Lord would move in his life and that he would experience this love that we talk about all the time in our home. And I don't know if you've ever tried to book plans with the Cirillos on a Saturday, but we don't do much planning on Saturdays. Why? Because those are the days where he's not working late shifts and those are the days where we understand as a family that he might be around Jesus. And we are the only Jesus that he might have any opportunity to be around for an entire seven days. And so we don't plan much on Saturday except hanging out, no plans with uncle so that he could experience the love of Jesus without us beating a Bible over his head. We don't plan much. But I'm going to tell you that in his honesty, in his complete transparency, I believe that he has a greater chance of looking himself in the mirror and being honest with the fact of what he lacks and it's in that non-fabricated moment of complete honesty where I believe that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords will eventually grab a hold of his heart and a hold of his soul. And I believe and we've been praying that the Lord would reveal himself to him and let him know who he truly is. But for many of us, right, believers, Christian it's on the social media, we got the bumper sticker. We wear the shirts, right? We can't be honest with ourselves as much as he's honest with himself because it would bring about a conviction that would make us feel bad about our current state and our current walk and our current journey with Jesus. 
So we, th- we, we say the right things. We, we sell ourselves on our current state. Meanwhile, only God knows that your focus on him is blurry. Your focus on him is blurry. And what happens, right? We keep moving away and it gets blurrier. And it gets blurrier. And it gets blurrier. Until you can't see him anymore until you can't see him anymore. And here's the thing about our Messiah, right? He's not the one moving away from us. We know where to find him. He's constantly pursuing us. And that's one, that's not, and for a lot of us, we think that man, maybe in isolation is, is like the enemy's checkmate move. And that's, that's actually the farthest thing from the truth. You see, Isolating you away from the body is his first move. And if you think that's all he's got, then you're mistaken. He's been doing this for thousands of years. After he starts to work on getting you at an island and away from your congregation, he then starts to work on creating an island at your house, right? Once he takes you out of the sanctuary on Sundays, he then tries to take your sanctuary inside the four walls of your house away from you as well. You used to pray as a family before bed every night, right? Every night as a family. And now as your kids get older, you only pray for the younger ones. And then eventually you're only praying for the youngest one. And then that slowly transitioned into you laying in bed, praying for yourself, hoping that your kids are praying the way that you showed them they should pray. But the family's not praying together anymore. You used to give thanks at the dinner table. Let's keep it a buck. You used to give thanks at the dinner table. You used to talk at the dinner table. You used to say grace at the dinner table. And now everyone eats standing up or everyone is eating in their own rooms. No grace, no conversation, no how was your day, no no Bible trivia. Let's keep going, right? You used to read your word religiously, read your word all the time, man. A chapter a day, right? A devotional a day, and now you're busy. And what happens to God slowly? You used to spend your first 30 minutes every day with your God. You wake up an extra 30 minutes early and you're like, I'm going to start my day with the Savior King. I'm going to set the tone and it goes from there. What happens as you get busy, right? You hit snooze a couple extra times, snooze a couple extra times. And now those 30 minutes in the morning with God have now turned to 20. Those 20 turned to 10. And now... You're just not in the word like you used to be. Now you ain't at church. Now you ain't praying like you used to. Now you ain't reading your word like you used to. And it happens gradually. It happens slowly. That's part of the scheme of the enemy. Why? Because he can make sure that you don't realize that you're actually off at sea, drifting away with the waves further and further and further away from what should matter most. And before you know it, not only have you lost your focus, but you've lost your sight, you've lost your vision. I'm the only one who actually blessed you with all of the things that you're currently now putting in focus before him, Jesus. Jesus. I know what you're thinking, and this is not a condemnation sermon. This ain't a put your mouth guard in kind of service. This ain't a man, if I knew how it was going to go down this Sunday, I would have never got dressed up. I would have put on my fighting sweatpants, took my jewelry out, right? Vaseline on my face before stepping into the sanctuary. But not at all, church. This is simply about being honest, being transparent, 
and understanding the state of where we are in order for us to do something about it and simply refocus. And for some of us, how can we ever refocus on something that we've never focused on to begin with? It reminds me of one of the greatest pieces of movie history when Hamilton Porter looks over at Smalls and says, you want some more? And he's like, huh? He's like, do you want a s'more? And of course, you know, in the Sandlot, one of the greatest pieces of movie history, the kid responds, how can I have some more if I never had anything to begin with? He says, you're killing me, Smalls. So you, you can't refocus on something you've never focused on originally. And for some of us, we need to take that initial step in actually focusing in for the first time on the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Today, we'll be in the book of Proverbs, chapter 4 at verse 18. The path of the righteous is like the morning sun, shining ever brighter till the full light of day. But the way of the wicked is like a deep darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. And again, we, we see the difference between the light and the darkness like we did last week, right? The, the path of righteousness is like the daylight. It's like the middle of the day type sun. It's like when the sun is the brightest, when, when, when the day is the sunniest. And so it is with vision. To see is to not be in complete darkness and to not see is to live in complete darkness, it can be hard to, to, to get the proper focus in a picture. I don't know if you've ever taken pictures. Some of us have been spoiled by the, the iPhone, and some of us still enjoy green text messages like Steve Mena. He loves to ruin in group text chats. You know what I mean? Like, it's all pretty and blue, and then Steve hops in, he just greens all over it. At a certain point, it's just rebellion. You know, come on board, sir. Come on board. And so it's, it's, it's important for us to understand that, that when we're snapping a picture, you speak to a photographer, it, it's important for them to, to, to focus properly, right? For, for, for the subject to be sharp. And it gets difficult to find the proper focus, especially when you're snapping pictures in a dark room. I mean, even if you're taking pictures on your phone, if you move a certain angle or you move too fast, your subject that you're focusing in on will then fall out of focus. See, focusing actually takes time, even on a smartphone. Usually your phone will tend to, to focus on what's brightest. And ain't that something? So do we. We tend to focus on what the world deems brightest, naturally. And then when you hold your phone up, you almost have to use your index finger to click the button on where you want them to, to refocus their attention. So even in life, as we, we live in a way where we don't have to hide what we're up to, right? When we start living our lives in a way that... that, that that we know is obedient to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, then everything in our lives can be seen in the daylight. Whereas the reality is when we're slipping, right? And, and, and when we're falling off and when we're living in sin or doing things that are not righteous, we tend to hide those things. We tend to do those things in secret, we tend to do those things in the dark. And if we don't come to a place where we eventually bring those things in the darkness and those things that we have hidden and those things that we're ashamed of and those things that we're struggling, if we don't get into the process of literally pulling them out into the light, then we never bring them out and give God authority to do the work he needs to work to rid them of our lives. We will find ourselves tripping over the culmination of things that are now taking residence in our lives, taking residence in our minds, taking residence in our hearts. 
And if we don't give God access to those things, then they will become stumbling blocks for the rest of our lives. Perfect illustration is our search history, right? Matter of fact, I said search history and about 63% of y'all were like, ooh. Mine is good, lies. Search history, right? Perfect illustration. If you're living in a way that the Lord is calling you to live, then you never have to worry about clearing out your search history. Your search history could stay in the day. Your search history could stay in the daylight. But if you've got some questionable, sinful search history, well, what do you do? You run to to keep those things in the dark. You run to erase them so that no one else knows what you're struggling with. And now, although that problem has been erased, right, so that no one can see what it is you're struggling with, what happens is you've actually buried it in a dark place. And the reality is, as a Christian, you'll feel bad about it. You'll condemn yourself about it. You'll beat yourself up about it. But if you don't drag that thing into the light, it will always find a way to Michael Jackson thriller its way out of the grave and into your life again. And it'll cause you to fall again and again and again. Why? Because you're not taking the head off of it. You remember when King David beat Goliath, right? He beat Goliath, man. Dude died after one stone. Beat Goliath. What did David do? Did he, did he do his march and did he chant and was he ecstatic? No, it's a little dark. But David went over and grabbed Goliath's sword and he ended it once and for all. Some of us need to do that with the Goliaths in our lives. We'll take it, we'll bury it, but we never go back over it and lift its own sword and, be, and make sure that we know that we know that that thing that entangles it, that thing that we struggle with, that that thing that keeps popping up in our life, that that addiction that keeps chasing us and pursuing us, the one that we feel good about today but may show back up tomorrow, it doesn't have to show back up tomorrow if you take the head off of it today. Got to do it. We have to do it. Because here's the thing. If we don't get rid of it for life, it will actually get worse. And not only will it get worse, but the Bible says that once sin is full grown, it leads to death. Leads to death. It always starts small. It never ends small. You see, when you're eyes are focused on the Lord, the the light of his glory, what does it do? It it will illuminate your passage. I mean, I don't know if you've ever tried walking in your garage in the dark. You finna hit everything. I mean, you walk into my garage in the daylight, you finna hit everything. I got one less friend now. A person won't even get a Christmas card. And so, good luck working, walking in the dark, man. It's tough. But when you chase the heart of God and you, and you look into his eyes and his gaze, it, it'll illuminate your passage. It'll make it easier for you to spot those traps, easier for you to spot those snares, easy for you to see the things that you used to stumble on, the things that you used to fall on, the things that you used to fail with. But here's the thing, when you're not focused on the way, the truth, and the life, well, then those traps that are set for you will always get their prey. You. It's like when we first moved to Texas, I was like, yeah, Ephraim, there's snakes out there? He goes, ah. Uh, I mean, what, what is ah? Like, he chose to omit some things in getting us here. I'm like, bro, I bet there's snakes everywhere. He goes, ah. He goes, uh, Wait till you eat the Mexican food out here, bro. It's really good. He'd always change the subject, you know? And I'm like, but 
They got rattlesnakes, right? He goes, nah, that's out west, bro. Desert, rattlesnake, not here. And I'm like, but they're snakes. Ah. Great. So we moved to Texas, right? We, we rent an apartment across the street from the Sabine High School. We eventually move into a house. And it takes me a little time before I get, you know, a mower. So I'm out there. He comes over. He's like, man, you really got to cut this grass. And I'm like, why? He goes, trust me. You're going to want to cut this grass. And I'm like, okay, I'll get to it. My next check, I'm going to go run out and get like a, a mower, maybe like self-propel. He goes, nah, get one of them deals that you sit on. He's from New York. He didn't really know how to say riding mower. Get one of those things you, you sit on and keep it low. Yep. Well, after cutting the lawn with my self-propel a couple of times, I realized why. There's these demonic creatures that don't have legs that are coming get you if you don't keep your lawn cut low. And the same can be said for us spiritually. In order for us to see the traps and the snares that are waiting for us, it's important for us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith that will illuminate the way and show us those things that we used to fall for that we no longer have to fall for anymore. Proverbs 4.20, my son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart for they are life to those who find them and health to the one's whole body. He's a father, right? This is King Solomon, and he's, and he's wanting to give advice to his kid. You ever try to give advice to your kid? It goes great, right? All the time, right? They just eat it all up. See, it doesn't matter how wise this king is, right? It doesn't matter how wise this dad is. I mean, he's the wisest of kings, and he's having to tell his child constantly throughout the book of Proverbs, listen to me, pay attention to me, look at me. In the same way that our God in heaven is trying to get our attention this morning. Man, I'm going to tell you, I got a six-year-old son. Love him. Love him. I'll leave it right there. I can't, I can deny him if I wanted to. The kid looks just like me. And the problem is he acts just like me. You know, and so if he's asking for help, he's paying attention. Daddy, can you help me with this? He's all in. I mean, I can go over 30 chapters. He's in. If it's something that he's asking advice for, he is all in. But if it's daddy just observing something that he could probably use some information on how to do things better, and he didn't ask me, he don't care. He, he does not care. He doesn't care. He don't even Google things to argue. He's just like, oh, okay, nah, I'm good. I've got a super smart 15-year-old, and I'm telling you, she's already the smartest person in our house. And my wife and I are in trouble. All right, this girl is brilliant. She's smart, and then she's well-read. And who does that? You know what I mean? And so you can't even argue with her. Why? Because she did research before she brought you the question or inquiry. And then she goes to school and rather than taking like art or French, she takes argumenting. I don't care what they call that class. They teach her how to argue with her parents. <laughs> that is non-biblical. Okay? Debate. That is not debate. You're talking back. Wait till I talk to your teacher. What's her name? Misha? Well, Keisha. Bet. Wait till I talk to her. Wait till I talk to her. She's setting you up to argue with me better. This is not okay. We finna handle this. Handle this, right? So our kids, man, and we were kids too. I remember when I was a teenager, my dad was like, hey, come outside with me, son. I'm going to show you how to change the oil. I'm like, how about I don't? Super Nintendo's revved up. NBA Live 95. I'm going to hang out in here, Pops. But you show Ephraim. We'll be fine. He goes, hey, come out. Let me show you how to change a tire. I'm like, 
How about I don't? Dad was like, come on outside. Let me show you how to measure twice and cut once. And if you see me build anything, you know that I didn't go out for that one either. <laughs> any house I built for the kid, any kitchen I built, there's always extra pieces. And not like just for like the dad that lost the screw. I'm talking like 18 things. So when the kids play with them, I'm like, if that door fell, the manufacturer failed you. Wasn't me. My wife's like, what are all those pieces about? I'm like, for dads who don't know what they're doing. But we got this figured out, and I, I just throw them all out. You get rid of the evidence. That way people know, like, you did fine. You did a good job. It looks great. But I remember being married, being a homeowner, my dad would smile on the other end of the phone when I would call him and I'd go, Pops, explain to me how to do that again. Show me how to do that again. I'll FaceTime you so you can see my face and you can show me how to do that again. See, Solomon constantly argued with his kid to pay attention. He constantly encouraged his son to keep the lessons of wisdom before his eyes. Why? The wisest king knew the importance of the, the human eye. Why? Because back then, just like now, we live in a highly distracted world where attentions are constantly being fought after. And now, more than ever, our attentions are poured out over these things that we carry in our pockets. All of our attentions are focused on these things that we carry in our pockets or these things that we carry on our wrists. We have these devices that we pay tons of money for in order for them not to just give us tools or resources to accomplish a daily task. But let's keep it real for our entertainment. That's why they keep getting bigger. I mean, Steve wears a man purse just to carry his Samsung. Every year he upgrades, and every year I'm like, Steve, it's a 32-inch TV screen. And he's like, no, bro, you should see what it does. It's got a, like a stylus. I'm like, it's big, man. It don't even fit in your pocket. He's like, no, bro, but it, the next one folds. I'm like, that's because it's... 42 inches. It's not a cell phone, all right? It's an HD TV. Like, what are we doing? What are we doing, man? What are we doing? The wisest king knew that we would battle for our mind and we would battle for the things that, that, that we're looking at, right? And for all of you wives that have been married plus 15 or 20 years ever since the, the smartphone this is for y'all, but I, if there was a clinical study that showed outcomes data on how much time your husband spent at the toilet before the cell phone was a thing in comparison to now where the cell phone is a thing, I will venture to tell you that the time difference has changed. It has changed dramatically. You ain't got to laugh at him while he's here. We all know, okay? We know, we know, all right? Back in the day when daddy got home from work and the kids were like, we want to play. And he was going into the bathroom. Mama would say, don't go in there. Give your dad at least 10 minutes. And that's the only time he had. He had 10 minutes because after 10 minutes, kids don't care. They're going to run up in there. It is what it is, homie, right? Now... Dad gets home from work. Kids are like, I want to I wanna hang out with dad. What does the mom tell the kids now? Give your dad about one and a half hours. Okay? Because someone decided to put ESPN on the phone now and Bleacher Report and YouTube and all of these things. It used to be a go in, do what you got to do, get out. Not anymore, folks. Most of y'all's husbands treat the bathroom like it's a man cave. I mean, they're not coming out of there any time soon. I mean, let's be honest. If 
you go to restaurants nowadays, what do you see? Two people sitting apart from each other. Are they gazing at each other's eyes? Are they full with great communication and conversation? Or are they both hurting their necks by looking down at their phones? Are there actual conversations that can be had there? Absolutely. But why do that, right? When we have a buffet of social media, we've got a buffet of media outlets where we've got commentators and people that of high value and esteem where we value their, uh, you know, opinions, where there's algorithms that work for us like a personal chef to feed us all the things that we love with our endless appetite for more content. Man, if there's a device around, if there's a cell phone around, if there's a tablet around and you're trying to give instruction or even share a short story, you will be competing against whatever is on that screen. And even your kids know it. I have an alarm on my phone at five o'clock that I wish I paid attention to every day, but when it comes up on my phone, it literally says, put your phone up and invest in your family. Why? Because if my kid is talking to me and I can't make eye contact with my kid, then I don't value what they're saying. Then what they're saying doesn't matter. And guess what? It won't be too much longer before that kid decides, you know what? Why do I bother? Why would I share? And eventually in life, they're going to go through some things where they need their mom and they need their dad and they need their grandma and they need their granddad or their niece or their uncle or their aunt to listen to them. And yet they're going to think that why should I share with them this when they won't even listen to the small things I need to share about. We need to focus We need to focus. And it's not just kids either. I got a friend of mine, grown man, who was the one that chirped up earlier. Hey, man. Oh, yeah? I like these apples, buddy. We can have, we can be in the middle of a real authentic conversation, sharing heart's desires, crying. Guess what he's doing? Reading emails. Tell me I'm lying. Breeze Riley, where are you? Stand up. Tell me I'm lying. Middle of a conversation. This one time me, him, and Justin are sharing some real tough stuff, man. I think Justin was crying. He only does that twice a year, usually for cowboy games. But this was something that was heartfelt, sharing. And guess what his buddy's doing? (laughs) I'm like, homie, how are you laughing? My friend from Norman is crying. You should be ashamed of yourself. I know you're, you're 17, but grow up. <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now, if you want to refocus on your family, if you want to refocus on your marriage, if you want to refocus as a parent, as a grandparent, you want to re-engage with the family, guess what you do? Put your phone out. Put your phone up. Sounds crazy, right? Some of y'all are like, I'm out. <laughs> I'm going to self-help on this one by watching a six-minute YouTube tutorial. Good luck. Tell me how that works for you, bro. Put your phone up, man. Put your phone up. You want to make a difference? Put your phone up. You want something that would help you focus on God? You want something that's going to help you focus on your spouse? You want something that's going to help you focus on being a parent, help you focus on what actually matters? Put up your device. Put it up. What would happen if you decided after today that you would put a basket at your dinner table for everyone in the house where you go, hey, for the next two to four hours, I need every device in there. I don't care if it's a cell phone. I don't care if it's a tablet, whatever it is, put it all in air. We finna have family time and everyone's going to be happy. First day may be miserable. Second day, they may hate you. Third day, things will start to change. (laughs) Things will start to change. But what if we decided to do that? What if we decided to take a stand that said two to four hours, everything up? Well, guess what? Maybe that teen of yours that never leaves their room, 
or start leaving their room. Maybe the, the kid that, that only gives you one word responses about how school was would talk more. Maybe that husband that just worked a double shift would actually let you know what they're struggling with, what they're fearful about, what they're stressed about at work, how work really went. Church, it's not just time to refocus on God, it's time to refocus on the family. It's time to refocus on the family. So honest question for you this morning, and you ain't got to say it out loud because God already knows that so you ain't got to lie in church. Is Jesus the head of your table in your family? Is Jesus the head? Does he sit at the head of the table in your house? And before you're quick to honesty, we always got the Marine Christians, yo. Yup. I'm that one liar. Or is Jesus the special guest that we only invite to the dinner table when we desperately need his breakthrough for something? Is he always invited? Is he always at the head of your table? Or is he only a special guest when we really need him? Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Keep your mouth free of perversity. Keep corrupt talk far from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to the paths for your feet and be steadfast in all of your ways. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil. Man, he stresses the importance of guarding your heart. Why? Because he knew that the heart is like a reservoir where change has to begin, right? Here's the thing. If a reservoir is polluted, it doesn't really matter how new or different the plumbing or the valves are. What will come forth from all of those new things is still going to be polluted because the reservoir is polluted. I mean, all throughout the Bible, we're warned to avoid a double heart, a hard heart, a proud heart, a unbelieving heart, a cold heart, an unclean heart. Man, the theologian Bridges once wrote that as Satan keeps a special watch on our hearts, so how much should we keep a special watch on it as well? He said that if a citadel is taken, the whole town must surrender. In essence, if the heart is captured, the whole man affections, desires, motives, pursuits will be handed over as well. Think about how the enemy usually works to snatch us away from where we should be. He does it every day, right? What does he do with a man? With a man, he uses our eyes. With the woman, he uses the imagination. And when the enemy presents us with an opportunity for, for sin, how does he dress it up for us, right? Right? It's like you're chilling at a bus stop, bus rolls by, right? And that bus is, is, is full with everything that seems to be fun. It's full with life's pleasantries. It's full with all of these promises of happiness. And what happens when you start to go down the wrong path, right? The enemy will then cause an increase in this thing called dopamine in your body. And what does that do? It causes an excitement towards doing the wrong thing. Look it up. Research it. And what happens is that the problem is that once we experience that excitement, once we experience that euphoria that you felt, we start to chase it. We start to pursue it. It almost becomes like a drug that we can't live without. We continue to chase after it making even the Christian weaker and weaker and weaker. When the reality is that we don't even know that we're walking to the edge of destruction, that we're walking further away from God, that we're losing our focus on what should matter. And if we don't quit or we don't stop or we don't refocus, it'll eventually ruin your life. You end up chasing that rush until the rush kills you. And if it doesn't take your life, well, guess what? The enemy of your soul is happy enough just taking your marriage. 
and take in your family. People really struggle with this. Christians are struggling with this every day. The enemy uses this same tactic to destroy marriages. Ask someone to, to dabble in sin before their marriage, right? What happens? There's an excitement to it. There's a you, euphoria with it. You start chasing and pursuing something that is out of God's will for your life. But how come when you get married, been 10, 15 years now, things are different, right? And the opportunity for intimacy outside of the marriage bedroom comes with a, with a, with a drug, a chase and a pursuit for that dopamine. But then once you're married, seven, eight, 10 years, right? What happens? Wife asks the husband, let's go lay in bed. And he's like, I'll meet you in there whenever the game is over or after I'm done with this last quarter of NCAA football. There is no dopamine that's being released because you're not doing anything that you shouldn't be doing. So the enemy implants that lie that you just don't love them anymore or that you're just not attracted to them anymore when the reality is that you are chasing a feeling. You're chasing that rush and the enemy's the dealer of that rush which might make you feel like it's the greatest thing while you're in there and while you're pursuing and while you're chasing, but it will destroy you and your family no different than leaving here being addicted to meth. Drug of your choice, name it. Guarding your heart, church, it may mean a temporary no. Guarding your heart may mean a painful no to the excitement and the enticements of what the world is offering you. But I'm telling you that that long-term gain for those short-term no's will give you a life of happiness and joy and well-being. Man, I once had a cousin tell me, Manny, I just want regular problems, bro. Give me regular problems. He'd, make, he'd made so many bad decisions that he'd have to chase them down all his life. And he felt like he had to cover up a lie with another lie, with another lie, with another lie. And he's like, look, I'm getting it all out on the open. And after that, I'm done, man. I'm not living like this anymore. I'm finished. I can't live this way anymore. Give me regular problems. You didn't throw out the trash. Amen. You left the toilet seat open again. Yes. Give me those. The theologian Worsby once said, if we pollute that wellspring, the infection will spread. Before long, hidden appetites will become open sins and lead to public shame. So guard our hearts first, right? Then the righteousness will control our tongue our speech and what comes out of our mouths. Keep our eyes looking straight ahead, the word says. In the same way that, that blinders used on horses do them so much good, I certainly think that, man, that should be something on Shark Tank for the man, something to keep us looking straight ahead and forward. Man, if our hearts are guarded and our speech is cleansed, and our eyes are looking forward, then keeping our destination in mind would keep us from wandering off the path that God has set for us. If we know where we're headed, if we know where we're headed, then we won't be spending our time, wasting our time, chasing every distraction that's calling us for a detour. Church, I don't know if you know this, but this world wants to pull you in so many directions. This world wants to pull you with so many distractions. Your job, your sleep, your busyness, your hobbies, your vices, your addictions, your lust, your pride of life, your heart, your feelings, your eyes. 
The enemy of your soul doesn't care how he accomplishes his task of stealing, killing, and destroying. All he cares about is eventually getting that by stealing, killing, and destroying your life, your family, and God's calling and plans for your life. But here's the story, right? Here's the good news, right? I don't care where you find yourself in the middle of that journey, I don't care if you find yourself in that pit. I don't care if you find yourself at the bottom. I don't care where you find yourself this morning. There is good news for you. There is good news for you. The greater is he that lives in you than he that lives in this world. That's good news. That's good news. That Jesus was sent into this world to take all of your sin debt in full, including the one you just did yesterday, your sin debt in full. So that you can spend the rest of your days living in freedom. Why? Because you as a Christian knows how the story ends. A lot of people out there searching for life's answers, scared. Why? Because they don't know how the story ends. And in this life as a Christian, you will have struggles. You will have hard times. You will go through valleys. You will go through things that you're like, how can this be a sign to me? I didn't sign up for this. You'll go through all of those things. But at the end of the day, you should have peace because you know how the story ends. Our Jesus has never been defeated. He don't take L's. He doesn't take losses We don't have to worry about how it ends. The Bible tells us how it ends. Our God is mighty to save. Our God is mighty to heal. Our God is mighty to restore. And wherever you find yourself this morning, he wants you to know your father in heaven wants you to know that he loves you. He loves you. He's crazy about you. He's been pursuing you. He's been chasing after you. He's been knocking at the door relentlessly. He hasn't quit. He knows all you've done. He knows all of the reasons why you feel like like you shouldn't be loved. He knows all of the reasons why you feel like you're too far gone. He knows all of the reasons why you think he wouldn't pursue you and knock on your door. And I'm telling you, he's knocking on your door anyway. He loves you. He's not looking at you as the person who keeps dropping the ball. He's not looking at you as the person that messed up. He's looking at you as the person who is righteous because they have accepted his son as Lord and Savior. And so therefore their entire knock list and resume and list of everything they've ever done wrong is gone. As far as the east is from the west. He doesn't see you at your worst. He sees you righteous, not by anything you've done, but by the sacrifice that his son did on the cross for you. For you. Maybe you're sitting here today and you know you need to refocus on your Messiah. You you ain't got to lie, Craig. God already knows Maybe you find yourself up against the wall or maybe you find yourself in a valley not knowing how you're going to get out of this this morning. And I want you to know this morning that God knows exactly what you're up against and God can do it. Or maybe you're sitting here today and you've never even taken that first step to actually making him the Lord of your life. You've never made that actual conscious decision to make Jesus the Lord of your life. My question to you is don't wait or why wait? 